Um, don't worry about looking at any particular verse this morning. I'm going through, it's topical, I'm going through a lot of verses, but the notes are in um, the app and I'll be sending out reminders during the week anyway. But you can follow along. Um, Proverbs is probably the best place to stick your finger. We'll be going through a lot of Proverbs today. As you can see, we're doing a, today I'm talking about new friends. Because uh, I think at the beginning of the year, it's time to sweep out the old ones and get a, a fresh batch. Anyone else do that? Um, serves you really well. Uh, no, not quite. But it doesn't mean there might not be some changes. So we've been looking at this new beginnings, new year, new you type thing. And we've looked at getting a new heart and how we can develop that, a new mind and how we can develop that and continue to develop that. This morning I want to talk about doing that in an area that is perhaps one of the biggest influencing factors in our lives, and that is obviously our friendships. You can work on renewing your heart, you can work on renewing your mind, but if you're not surrounded by people who are going to encourage and reinforce the work that you're doing and the place you want to go and the person you want to be, then it is going to be hard, if not impossible, for you to get there. Those people are not going to, going to add sort of impetus to what you're doing. They're going to be a drag on what you're doing. Um, so as a parent, I now understand what I didn't understand when I was a kid about friendships and just how important they actually are. To, my, to me, as a young boy, like about eight or nine, my friends were just my friends. And they were far better to hang out with than my parents, right? They were just so much more fun. But to my parents, and my mum in particular, some of the kids that I hung around with were spawns of the devil, right? <laughs> sent into the universe to mislead the chosen one, right? <laughs> that was the influence that she saw that they had on me. But to me, they were just my friends, and I couldn't understand why she felt so strongly about this. I mean, every eight or nine-year-old starts smoking, right? <laughs> Makes homemade explosives, right? causes a car accident in the street by shining mirrors into the eyes of oncoming traffic, rides mini bikes up and down the road, decides that they're going to be evil Knievel and build giant ramps to ride said mini bikes over very fast, ending up in the emergency room. Every eight or nine year old does that, right? What could be wrong, what could be wrong with that? But friends can definitely determine the direction and the quality of your life. Now that's, that's not shifting blame and refusing to take responsibility for ourselves. We need to remember that no one can make us do anything. The buck ultimately stops with us. But we need to have a healthy understanding and acknowledgement that friendships have a very big influence on our lives. And the things that make friendships great are the things that also make them dangerous. <coughs> Because when we're with people that we like, we let our guard down. And we humans have a compelling need to want to be accepted, don't we? We don't want to be left out. We don't want to be out of the in crowd. We want people to like us. We want people to accept us. And that can leave us incredibly vulnerable to all sorts of negative and unhelpful influences. I can tell you I've done some of the most stupid things in my life simply because I wanted to fit in. Anyone else? We've all got those stories. But it's not all cautionary. The beauty of good friendships, of course, is that they can influence you in such a healthy and positive direction as well. And many of us have benefited and still do from healthy, positive relationships. So what we need to understand about friendships is they can be our greatest asset or our greatest liability. So let's take a quick look at some of the good reasons you might want to need to be a little bit more selective about who you allow around you. And the first is this, friends shape who we are. Friends shape who we are. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, Paul writes, don't be deceived, bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. Paul's not quoting the Bible when he says that. He's quoting a Greek poet called Menander. Now, why does that even matter? 
Because this truth is so self-evident that everyone can acknowledge it, right? It's not just a Bible thing. Now, it's not, it is a Bible thing now because Paul put it in the Bible, right? But it's not just a Bible thing. And you know how sometimes people go, yeah, well, I don't believe the Bible, I don't follow the Bible or whatever. This is not a Bible thing. This is a universal truth that everyone can acknowledge, that bad company corrupts good character. And all truth is God's truth anyway, but we'll get talk about that another day, right? But I became a Christian when I was 19, in August of 19... <laughs> 85, right? 1985. And uh, I was new, I was new, brand new, freshly minted Christian. And I was in this little church in the inner city in Paddington, and it had a great group of people there, um, especially younger, younger, young adults. And there's, even when I say young adults, some people were, were 10 years older than me, some in their early 30s. But we always hung around together, and we'd, we'd go out after church, and we'd catch up with one another. And it was just, for someone who was new to the faith, it was just an incredibly supportive, encouraging, affirming group of friends to have, right? And it helped me really solidify and grow. But less than five months later, I was posted to Townsville into an infantry battalion with over 600 guys and only one other Christian. And I made a point when I got there, because I was going to do this, that I went and I, I found myself a good church to go to, which Townsville in the 80s wasn't that easy. Um, the first church I went to, there were literally five women in their 80s that were knitting. And I figured that wasn't going to work for me. That was the youth group, right? <laughs> then I went to another one, and it was three families. And I thought... I'm going to end up on a cult documentary if I stay here, right? So I'm not going to stay here. Anyway, I found one. And I was reading my Bible and I was praying and I was going to church and I was developing relationships. Heather was still living in Sydney at that time. She was writing me letters, encouraging me to, you know, stick to it and and keep going. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. Because in those four months that I had been a Christian in Sydney, I'd managed to lead two people to Jesus in that time, right? How many of you led to Jesus? (laughs) But, no, anyway, I, I was just like, I was a zealot, right? I was, I was going to go for it. And so I'm going, okay, I'm going to Townsville, 600 guys, one other Christian, this is going to be a cakewalk. They're all going to be saved by the time I'm finished with them, right? This is how this is going to work out. And so I really did try that. But, but in order to reach these people, my philosophy was I have to be with these people. I have to go where they go. I have to hang around with them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Can you see where this story is going, Right? Within less than a year, I wasn't reading my Bible and praying and trying to reach these guys. I was in a band, I was at clubs, uh, I was drinking a lot, I was doing drugs, you name it, okay? In less than a year, everything they were doing had rubbed off on me rather than what I wanted to rub off onto them. Why am I telling you this? Because I'm certainly not proud of it. Because there is this thinking that says, that's not going to happen to me. I'm safe to hang around these people who get up to all sorts of no good because I'm smarter than that, right? That's not going to happen to me. I'm going to influence them. I'm going to win them over, not vice versa. And sometimes that can actually happen. One-on-one, that can definitely be true. You know, nine out of ten people who become Christians do so as a direct result of a close relationship, right? Now, but even then, I've seen when that doesn't work. And you know where I've seen that not work? In romantic relationships, I've seen it when Christian girls decide to date non-Christian guys and the thing is, I'm going to get him saved. You know what almost hap- happens almost invariably? She gets dragged away, right? Now, that's not a criticism of women. It can happen for men too. I've just seen so many women, so many young girls go down that track where they're like, I'm going to get him saved and they end up just walking away from the Lord. But when it's you versus a bunch of people, that's a completely different dynamic again. You're up against something even more powerful. And you've still got that need to want to fit in. In fact, in some situations, it's it's almost essential that you fit in for the sake of your survival. Now, we'd like to think that good character influences bad company. But Paul says, don't be deceived. 
Do not be deceived. Don't fool yourself. It doesn't work like that. Bad company corrupts good character. It's almost always the opposite. And you may be thinking, no, no, not me. I'll be the exception. I can almost guarantee you will not be. We need people around us who are going to add to our lives, to encourage us and support us in becoming the sort of person we want to be and working towards the things that we want to work towards, not being a drag and not undermining us. So ask yourself this question as we go into this year. Out of the people you're hanging around, do you want to be like them? Do you want to be like them? Do you need their approval and their acceptance? And are you okay if you don't actually fit in? The second thing is this, friends not only shape who we are, friends affect where we go. Look at how the wisest man on earth, can you put number two up please mate? Affect where we go. The wisest man on earth at the time put it like this, Proverbs 13, 20. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. How do you become wise? You walk with the wise, by hanging around wise people, by doing life with people who are making wise, sensible, prudent choices, because wisdom rubs off, it's contagious. What's wisdom? Well, it's not intelligence, right? I know a lot of intelligent people who are not very wise. Anyone else? Right? A lot of, lot of smarts, a lot of brain, but not very wise in the way that they live their lives. Wisdom is like applied knowledge. Wisdom is the understanding that life is connected and there are consequences to our choices. That what we do in any given moment will actually play out later on down the road. Wisdom is understanding that there is actually some, a good way to live and there's a poor way to live and they make the wise choices. Okay, you want wisdom, you want to be wise and make wise choices, then hang around wise people. But here's the warning on the other side. The Bible doesn't say hang around with fools and you'll become a fool. I mean, if you hang around with the wise and you'll become wise, it almost stands to reason that if you hang around with fools, you're going to become a fool. But that's not the whole story. It's not what God says will happen to you. It says the person who hangs around with a fool will come to harm, right? Will come to harm. The person who does life with fools will be impacted by the behaviour of fools. That is, you may never buy into the fool stupidity. You may never see things the way they see it or believe the things that they do or even do half the things they do. But eventually, the shrapnel from the explosion of their life will ultimately impact you by virtue of your proximity to them. Has anyone ever seen this happen? Yes. There are lots of cautionary tales about this. But again, here's what we do. We rationalise it away. We say to ourselves, I'm going to be okay because I'm actually not like them. I don't see things the way they see things. I don't believe the things that they believe. I don't do what they do. Therefore, as long as I'm like that, I won't have the same consequences of them. And Solomon says, not so fast, not so much. The person who hangs around with a fool will, in fact, come to harm. You don't have to be a fool or be like a fool you're hanging around with to be affected by someone else's foolish behaviour. Now, I've told, you, I've told you, I joined the army at 16, which meant that I was on an army base with about 900 people armed with guns and explosives and no fully formed brains, right? That's, that's, that was my life. So risk-taking and stupidity were, were just part of it because our brains were literally still forming that whole concept of danger and stuff like that and risk wasn't working for all of us. And every year when we would go on leave, we would come back and we would find out about the guys who were not coming back. And these guys were not coming back, not because they'd left the army, but because they were dead. And they were dead because they got into a car with a fool. They thought, they got into a car with someone who thought, I don't need to worry about drink driving, I'm cooler than that. I don't need to worry about speed, I'm better than that. I don't need to worry about road rules. And they were dead, almost invariably. Every leave we would come back and we would find out so-and-so was killed over the holidays. My last week in the army, I had to go and play at two of just these funerals. That's how prevalent it was. We've all seen this stuff. It's on the news all the time, isn't it? When we see a car driven by some teenager who happened to have four or five other friends in the car and they crash... And the driver usually ends up in hospital and everyone else ends up dead. Have you noticed that? 
if you hang around with a fool, you will come to harm. That's what Solomon says. And don't think there's a workaround in this either, that somehow you can stop your friend being a fool. See, fools are not stupid, right? Fools know the difference between right and wrong. The thing about a fool is they don't care, right? They just don't care. The Bible says, for that reason, don't even try and correct a fool. They think they're above the rules for normal people. They think they're impervious to consequences. There's no point trying to introduce facts to a fool. They already know the facts. They just don't care. They don't think that life is connected and that there are consequences to their decisions. And if you think this doesn't apply to you, that somehow, no, 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 I can do better than everyone else and get around that and get these people to see reason, then you're a fool too. That's just the way it is. Here's the thing. People who really don't care about their own life are not going to care about your life. Right? They don't care about their life. They are not going to care about your life. If you have friends who don't care about their marriage, they're not going to care about your marriage. If you have friends who don't care about their money, they're not going to care about your money. If you have friends who don't care about abusing their bodies, they're not going to care about you abusing your body. If you have friends who don't care about cheating and lying, they're not going to care about you cheating and lying. If you have friends who don't care about breaking the law, they're not going to care about you breaking the law, and so on and so on and so on. Friendships affect where you go, and a, company, a person who is a companion of fools will suffer harm. That's pretty sobering stuff, isn't it? Will, will suffer harm. But let's go from the dark side to the light side because there are positives in friendships too, okay? There are some real positives in friendships too and I want to finish with the positives. Your friends will love you no matter what. This is why some of us need new friends because we need friends who will love us no matter what. Now that seems, might seem a little bit soppy but as you go through life, you are going to go through some significant ups and some significant downs. And having people in your life who love you no matter what is going to be absolutely priceless at those times. There are times in life where you find out just who your friends actually are. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? You go through something and you find out just who your friends actually are. And that's okay. Because we don't need hordes of people. I laugh when I look at some people's Facebooks and they've got a thousand friends. No, you don't. <laughs> You've got a thousand people that you're connected to in some vague way on... I get friend requests from people I don't even know. And I'm like, yeah, sure, should we go for coffee? Like, who the hell are you? I don't know. You know, there are no brownie points for collecting friends, right? You realise that, okay? <laughs> So we don't need hordes of people around us. In fact, Proverbs 18, 24 says, a man of many, com many uh, companions may come to ruin, but there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. See, being popular is not all it's seemed or all it's cracked up to be. The fact that you may have a lot of people around you doesn't mean that any of them will be standing next to you when things hit the fan, right? We don't need hordes of people around us. We just need people who are going to be around us when we need them. So how do we know who these people are? How do we pick them out from the crowd? Well, you know what I found through life? They emerge. It's not that we go and select them. Our real friends emerge through the course of life. They show themselves to be your friend. How do they do that? Well, in a few ways. A friend is someone who sticks with you for a start, right? who sticks with you. Proverbs 7, 17, uh, 17, 17 says, a friend loves at all times, at all times. And a brother is born for a time of adversity. You know, some people are just fair weather friends. Right? Some people are just fair weather friends. They'll be with you as long as everything is okay. But the minute things get a bit icky, the minute things get a bit bumpy, like a rat out of an aqueduct, they're gone, right? They're just gone. They don't want to be around hard things and they can't be around hard things. And initially, that can be really hard to take, but I've learned over time not to judge people like that because not everyone's equipped to be around people who aren't doing well. Okay, so go easy on people who can't be there for you, all right? It's hurtful sometimes, but be there. But a real friend actually shows up. A real friend shows up knowing they, they don't have to have the answer for you. 
They don't have to have it all worked out. They don't have to be able to solve your problem. They don't have to be able to take it away. They're there because they're determined not to let you go through it alone. It doesn't mean they're going to be all over you. It doesn't mean they're going to be there 24-7, but they will be there if and when you need them to be. That's how you know that someone is a friend. So who do you have in your world like that? Someone who is there when the rubber hits the road. Someone is there when things get tough. Someone that is there that you know you can rely on when things are not going well. That's someone you need to invest in. The other thing is a friend will always tell you the truth. Proverbs 27.6 says, Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. A friend tells you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. An enemy does that. An enemy multiplies kisses. And someone who doesn't actually care about you, they'll tell you what you want to hear. They'll tell you stuff to stroke your ego and to try and just make you feel better or whatever it happens to be. But a friend, a friend will tell you the truth and sometimes that truth can actually hurt. In my last church, there was a lady and we were quite good friends with this lady and had been for many years. And one day she came to see me and she'd been given a letter by a group of her friends that had basically outlined some things that they were really struggling with about her. They didn't want to bring her down. They wanted to reconcile this stuff with her. And they said, look, here's what we're finding it hard. There are all these things that you do that are really, we're really struggling with and we want to get past this. And she brought me the letter and she, she left it with me. And she said, could you read this? And could you tell me if any of this, you think any of this is actually true? I said, sure. And I went back to her and I said, it's all true. She never spoke to me again. I did that kind of believing that she was asking me because she, she wanted to do something about it. I thought, okay, this is good. You're checking this out. You're not relying on your reflexive action that, that is like, I don't like anything you're saying. You're all wrong. No, she brought it and I thought, this, this is actually mature. It wasn't. Um, I think she was hoping that I'd say, no, 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 none of it's true. And I didn't do it like, yeah, it's all true, you suck, right? I, I, I was like, no, look, th this is really hard to hear, I understand that, but yeah, these, these, things, these are things that you do, and you do regularly. Um, because I wanted to be a friend to her. I loved her, I respected her, and I knew this truth was going to hurt. You know, I've had lots of people do some very say, do and say some very mean things to me in order to hurt me over the years. And, and some of that has really hurt quite a lot. But nothing has hurt more than someone who loves me telling me a truth I didn't want to hear. Right? Anyone else in that? You know, you can say all sorts of crap about me, but by and large, I'm like, whatever, that's, that's you. But when it's someone I love and respect comes up to me and says, hey, Adrian, whoosh. That's like, ugh. That's why it says wounds from a friend can be trusted. Don't buy into the rubbish that, that you know, if, you, if, if you're going to be someone's friend or you love them, you're never going to hurt them. Sometimes you are. Not maliciously. You speak this in order to bring health and healing to them. Not to hurt them, but it's going to be a little bit painful when they have to hear that truth. So who do you have in your life that is willing to tell you the truth when you need to hear it? Who do you have in your life that is willing to be that person, to be the unpopular person in your life if necessary, so you can hear the truth? Invest in that relationship. And the final thing is this, your friends speak with you and not about you. Proverbs 16, 28 says, a perverse person stirs up conflict and a gossip separates close friends. Real friends, true friends, they don't talk rubbish about you behind your back. They just don't. They don't talk to other people. They talk to you. Trust is the basis of a relationship. And if someone is talking about you and your business to other people, how could you trust them? Your friends will come to you first, not simply talk about you. Friends are people you can confide in. Friends are people you can talk to and know that it's not going to go any further if you ask them to. So how does this fit with our call to love our neighbour as ourself, to be loving people? Because it sounds like we're going to be really selective. It sounds like we're going to choose to not be friends with people, and that's absolutely true. But aren't we meant to love everyone? Yes. 
but we certainly don't have to entrust ourselves to everyone. Jesus didn't. In fact, there's a verse in the Bible that said he did not entrust themselves to them because he knew what was in their heart. Now, it's true that we don't know what's in people's heart, but you know what? We can see people's behaviour. We can see what comes out of their mouth. We can see their life and how it's going. And they can be great clues and cues as to whether or not we should trust them. Love is about using our brain as well as our heart. We can be wise with our friendships, so we stick around with people that align with the life we want. We can love everyone, but we can love some people from more of a relational distance, right? From more of a relational distance. We can be kind and we can be generous. We can be there for people. We just don't have to entrust ourselves to everyone or allow everyone to be the people we spend the most time with. So if we want a new you this year, in addition to renewing our hearts and working on a new mind, we may need to take a close look at who we're spending our time with and the effect and the proximity that they have in our lives. And we may need to shuffle that around a little bit in order to be the people we want to be and to go the places we want to go. Amen.